From Luke chapter 10, hear the word of the Lord. Just then a, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you've given the right answer, do this and you'll live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. And then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I'll repay you whatever, whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Who is my neighbor? When I was growing up, that's usually when you say, how old are you? Because, see, when uh, someone says, when I was growing up, that means they're old. So when I was growing up, how old are you? Well, that was kind of weak. This is the interactive part of the sermon. So when I say, uh, when I was growing up, you say, how old are you? When I was growing up, how old are you? I'm so old that when I was growing up, we didn't have cell phones. We had those rotary dial types of phones that you probably haven't even seen before in your life. The kind where you, when you dialed a zero, you just prayed people didn't have zeros in their phone number because you dialed the zero, you had to wait for it all to come back around before you could dial the next number. That kind of phone, right? When I was growing up, I, I'm so old, we didn't have inner cloud or network or whatever you call it. We didn't have uh, social media and a thousand people telling me how stupid I look. Uh, I mean, they still did tell me that, but not a thousand, right? Um, we didn't have social media. We had TV. Now, when I was growing up, we went from black and white TV. I remember the first color TV we got in our house. My brothers, who are a lot older than me, they remember the TV coming into the house, right? Even black and white. My parents, I'm guessing, may even remember when they got a radio in their house. Any of you remember when you got a radio in the house? How old are you? Anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, when I was growing up, we didn't have YouTube giving us instructions step by step and showing us exactly how to, you know, fix a faucet or showing us silly TV shows in Japan and all this kind of stuff, you know. When I was growing up, we didn't have microwaves. Uh, we didn't, uh, we cooked over a stove fire, okay, that's not true, we didn't cook <laughs> over a stove fire, but some of you might have. Um, when I was growing up, travel was pretty limited. I grew up and I had a car when I was in high school, but that car probably could get me around town. I don't know if it could get me even around the state. My dad, however, when he was growing up, not only did he live through the day of the rotary phone, when he was growing up, it was the party line where you had to ask the operator to connect you to somebody else, right? When he was growing up, he rode a horse to school, no kidding, and then had cars that couldn't get you very far. But uh, today, we have, when I was growing up, you know, people went to the neighborhood uh, well, in our case, Lutheran Church, right? You went to the neighborhood church of whatever denomination, and you didn't go to other denominations. When we were on vacation, we found the nearest Lutheran church. We couldn't imagine going to another denomination. Today, we have people not only who have come from all sorts of denominations and gather here together, we have people who come from Colville, from Medical Lake, from uh, the Spokane Valley to come to church here. We even have people who come from the South Hill, though I think they have 
have to get a passport, right? <laughs> Look at that. She's got her passport. Anyway, I, when I was growing up, travel was somewhat limited. It was the day of the space race. So there was that attempt and desire and fulfillment of landing a man on the moon and the race with the Russians to do that, right? But there wasn't collaboration, <laughs> cooperation. And we still have competition today, but there is more collaboration today among nations and peoples. When I was growing up, travel was pretty limited. You, if you heard of somebody doing international travel, that seemed exotic and fanciful. You, you listened with rapt attention as they described peoples from other cultures and places. Today, you can probably, if you find deals, you can go to Europe or even China for even less than what you can go to Disneyland at times. It's amazing about today. But travel was somewhat limited. Uh, our understanding of the world and who is the neighbor was somewhat limited. Uh, it's much different today. I have Facebook friends who are from Dominican Republic and from uh, Israel and from Romania. Skip Blodnik and I went on a Thrive and Builds uh, Habitat project in Romania a few years back. I've got these people all over. And yet, my next door neighbor, who I've lived next door to for over 18 years, I still don't know his last name. I've got him in my can tax as Mike. I know it's terrible. But I just know him as Mike, and he just knows me as Jim. I still don't know, I, and I'm ashamed of this, but the people who moved in across the street, I still don't know their last names because, see, we can go all winter by pushing a button, going into our garage and going into our house and not speaking with our neighbors for months on end throughout the year here. And then they have a lake place, so they're gone all summer. I still don't know their names. It's terrible. Who is my neighbor? The world has become a much smaller place today, and yet... In many respects, it seems like it's become a much lonelier place. Jesus, in his day, there were clear delineations about who is my neighbor. Even if you go to Israel today, you know very clearly who the Orthodox Jews are. You know who are Arab and Muslim. You know who might be a Christian priest or monk. You know who are tourists, for sure. <laughs> by the way people dress, by language, or maybe accents, by... Uh, where they live in the city, what quarter they're from. I mean, you, you know there are clear delineations, right? In Jesus' day, it was very clearly delineated who was Jew and who was Gentile, who was slave and who was free. You knew uh, Gentiles, Roman, and you knew Samaritans, and you knew Jews. And, and, and these lines were clearly delineated. That's when, when Jesus tells this story about the Good Samaritan, the guy lying in the ditch. It's so challenging to all those delineations because, see, because, see the guy who's lying in the ditch is stripped of all of his clothes. You can't tell if he's Jew or Gentile, slave or free. You can't tell. If he's face down in the ditch, you can't tell if he's circumcised, <laughs> if he's Jewish or Gentile, right? That's why it challenges all these clear delineations. The, uh, the, the guy who's asking Jesus, the lawyer who asked Jesus, who is my neighbor, see, uh, he wants to know, who do I have to help? Do I have to help this guy in the ditch, right? We have all sorts of ways of justifying ourselves, of justifying our inaction, of justifying our prejudice, our selfishness. When the lawyer asks the question, who is my neighbor? He's wanting to narrow the field of who he has to help. When Jesus responds with the Good Samaritan story, he's wanting to broaden the field. The lawyer is asking to want to uh, know clearly what are the requirements, what are the commandments, what do I have to do? And Jesus is wanting to ask about love. Not so much who do you have to help, who does God want you to help? And if you have to ask about love and want that defined, then you're missing the whole point. Right? Because what Jesus is talking about is a love that's about the heart. It's about compassion. It's about humanity. It's about decency. And the real difference between Jesus and the Christian movement about defining the neighbor is especially about the enemy. About loving the people who don't love you. It's easy, he says, to love people who love you. 
But I'm calling you to love the people who don't love you. To love your enemy. To love the people on the other side of the wall, on the other side of the border. And I know there's a whole lot of talk about walls these days. And this isn't intended to be a political commentary. There may be reasons why we need strong borders and maybe even walls and all that kind of stuff. But the question is, how do you treat the people on the other side? And Jesus' parable today about the Good Samaritan does have something to say about that. It does have something to say about compassion, especially for the people that are on the other side and that we don't like or who may not like us or whatever. He does have something to say about loving those even with a cost, even if it's going to cost you. Because, see, the guy who's saying this dies on the cross. He, it cost him everything to love you and me, and we are clearly on the other side. Tomorrow, we have 22 or 3 high school youth and some adults who act like kids who are going to the Dominican Republic on a mission trip or servant trip. Uh, we do this every couple of years. Uh, we've done usually alternating between going somewhere uh, international and somewhere in the US. We've gone to uh, Alaska and Boston and the Gulf Coast. Uh, we've gone to Mexico several times. The last few times we've gone to the Dominican Republic. Um, and partly uh, because of the cost and partly because of experience. Uh, and what our kids experience there. there. There are some critiques about these mission trips uh, that are done from the United States. Well, one of the questions that inevitably arises, not necessarily from our congregation, but people ask, why do you have to go so far away? You know, isn't there a lot of need just right in our own backyard, right in our own uh, community? And there is. And Mother Teresa once said, or at least it's attributed to her, that if you want to change the world, start at home. Start in your own house with your spouse, with your kids. You don't have to go far away to change the world, right? Now, we do a lot of ministry for the community. Our congregation does. We, we have, uh, oh, we help with the homeless teens downtown and crosswalk ministry. We are big supporters of the Mead Food Bank. We uh, have an after-school program for the community, the kids right behind us in this neighborhood. We, uh, oh gosh, the list goes on and on and on. The Bites to Go program. Uh, we work with other congregations in helping homeless. We, I mean, there's a lot of things we do. And our kids, on the years that they aren't going, say the Dominican Republic or far away, we do mission trips regionally. Uh, so we did, the last few have been to... Wenatchee and then Yakima last summer was to Shoshone through Luther Haven and the servant project there. So uh, we do that as well. But see, Mother Teresa, <laughs> I, I can't imagine that she would say, look, if you want to make a difference in the world, start at home and stay there. <laughs> right? She wouldn't say that. She would say start at home, but it doesn't stop there from the woman who went to Calcutta to serve the poorest of the poor in the world. Start at home, don't neglect those at home, but you also <laughs> don't just focus only on the people at home. This world needs you too. That's the mistake I see in so many congregations. There are those uh, congregations that are so focused on helping the world outside, but the people within their walls are neglected. They end up dying because of it. The flip side of the coin is true too, though. There are those congregations who are so focused on taking care of their own, they never do anything for anyone else. It's the very definition of what the church fathers called sin, in cravatus in se, turned in on the self, and that too is deadly. If you want to change the world, start at home. But don't stop there. Huh? There are these critiques about these mission trips, one is that why do you have to go so far away? Well, it's not an either or, it's both and. The other is that a lot of people make this critique that, uh, you know, all these American churches sending their kids all over the world and, and throwing their money and candy at kids and stuff like that. They go in for a week and then they leave. What kind of real difference can be made? Are they ever addressing systemic issues that are going on? Or do they go in just to feel good about themselves and look like good Christians and, and, and it's just a band-aid, it's just some aspirin? Right. 
My guess is that those who are making such critiques haven't been on these trips, at least not the ones that we've been going on. Because that is not the experience or the reality of what we've experienced in going down to the Dominican Republic. These kids, when they go down there, and adults, uh, they encounter the kids and the people down the Dominican Republic, and I'm telling you, our lives are as much touched as theirs, but their lives are also touched and changed. Their hearts are changed, lives are changed. These relationships in this short, intense period of time, these bonds are made that when the kids, if they go back a second time, it's amazing immediately that they recognize each other and even remember names and these, these relationships are forged. They become Facebook friends. They keep in touch. I, uh, they learn probably more than they ever go down to teach or share, like how to live without a cell phone for a week, which is no insignificant life lesson for them, <laughs> let me tell you. But the learning and the lessons are far deeper than that. If we didn't go down and do these trips, I'll tell you what the critique would be from others. The critique would be that Americans... And these Christians, these churches, they just keep the money to themselves. They only care about themselves. They only stay in their own little bubble in their ivory tower. They never get out to the world and see the plight of what people are going through in the rest of the world. If we didn't go down and participate in Children of the Nation, COTN, the ministry that we work through, Systemic changes wouldn't be happening impossible. See, COTN, they are building schools and having clinics for these bates. Bates are these little shanty towns where the Haitians who live in the Dominican Republic, where they live. And they aren't supported by the government. See, they, they aren't even liked by the people and despised by the Dominicans. And yet, they are providing the cheap labor working in the sugar fields and their economy depends on that, but they aren't taken care of. So COTN, they build schools in these bates. They, they try to provide for education and a better life for these kids as they grow up. They're providing clinics and health care that they wouldn't otherwise get. They're provided fresh water and these systemic things to help make changes in these bates and for these Haitians, the poorest of the poor there. But none of that would be possible if it weren't for our participation and support and resources and help. So for all those who make these claims that we're going down in our arrogance and, and just flashing our money and we go for a week and don't make a difference, it's not true. It's not true in the relationships. It's not true in the systemic changes that are taking place. What I don't know, what I don't know is this. This next week, who will be the Good Samaritans? Will it be you going down there and helping Will you be the Good Samaritan? Or will you be the person who's broken and you get down there and you have these people who are loving on you and, and as soon as the bus horn comes into the bates, you have all these kids and people who are running up and hugging you and you find out they're the Good Samaritan. Maybe it's both. Maybe that's the way it's supposed to be. What I do know is this. In the story, the guy who's lying in the ditch, or in the story, the guy who hangs on the cross, when he calls you to serve, he's doing you a favor. When he calls you to take up your cross, when he calls you to follow, when he calls you to sacrifice, when he calls you to love your neighbor, especially your enemy, it isn't a demand. It's a gift. 